Hello everyone, I'm Peter Jacob. I'm a curator here for the Early Flight Collection and we're going to talk about a very significant event in early flight history and I'm not going to tell you what it is until we go over here to the gallery. So follow me, just over here to Gallery 107. I seem to be talk starting all my talks this way lately, but as, as everybody remembers, uh, uh, the big anniversary for aviation, of course, was 2003 when we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Wright Brothers' uh, historic first flights at Kitty Hawk with the 1903 airplane that we have on display upstairs. And uh, as I've been joking lately, uh, particularly also after the uh, 1957 anniversary of uh, Sputnik, everything now is the 100th anniversary of aviation or the 50th anniversary of space flight, every, every event. So we, uh, we have lots of anniversaries that we seem to be addressing these days. But uh, what we're going to talk about today is actually a significant <laughs> anniversary uh, in flight. And in my mind, because it really um, marks the, uh, the change from when aviation became just an experimental curiosity to uh, the beginnings of uh, a viable technology in a true, a true industry, a true uh, uh, technology that would pervade and have influence in society at large. And that, of course, is the year 1909. Um, 1909 uh, was a, a pivotal year in flight. Many, many, great many things happened in 1909. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about the, the Wright military flyer up here, which is the world's first military airplane. So 100 years ago, military aviation began with the purchase of the military flyer by the United States government. Uh, 1909 uh, was the year of the famous Louis Blériot crossing of the English Channel with an airplane similar to the one uh, behind you here. And while that flight was not necessarily the longest um, distance or duration, even up to that time, it had powerful significance in having flown over the English Channel and again demonstrated uh, the viability of this technology. And one of the other really pivotal events of 1909 for aviation was uh, the great aviation meet in Rennes, France, the, the great uh, the Great Aviation Week in the Champagne region of, of France. And it was the world's first uh, uh, organized uh, gathering of uh, flying meeting, first, first, the first major flying meeting in the world. And usually what happens with the firsts of things, they kind of start small and, and things build. But in a curious way, this was the first uh, of the early aviation meets, but it was, would remain by far the grandest and the biggest and the most significant uh, of all of them. It, uh, uh, the idea was uh, uh, launched by the, uh, the wealthy Champagne uh, uh, growers, uh, Champagne region in, in France, and they were supporting uh, this event. Uh, it was not just simply a, a going to be a gathering of flyers. This was really going to be an event. Uh, during the, the week, uh, 100 years ago this week, um, August 22nd to the uh, 29th, uh, 1909, upwards of 500,000 spectators attended uh, the Great Aviation Week. They built uh, hangars and a huge grandstand, a 600-seat restaurant. There were circus performers to entertain in between the flights. There were uh, amenities such as a barber shop and a beauty shop to attend to all the, uh, uh, the wealthy and, uh, and, and elegantly dressed uh, spectators. Uh, they essentially built a little city on this airfield outside Rands and uh, uh, put forward uh, not only a grand show but also extensive prize money uh, for these events. There were altitude and duration and distance and speed events uh, of various types and the uh, sponsors put, put forward uh, a total of $40,000 in prize money. That's 1909 $40,000 uh, uh, purse for this event. Uh, this, uh, the, the pilots who participated uh, were like the movie celebrities and sports figures of today. Uh, these were really the first great celebrities of the 20th century as we, as we tended to find celebrity today. Uh, it really was a grand event. It really was uh, a major happening, to use a, a term of a few decades later. And uh, it really uh, marked uh, the beginning of that kind of uh, aviation spectacular. But it was also a really important event because, again, it, it established the viability of this technology. Uh, when the Wrights flew in 1903, uh, there was uh, not necessarily a uh, universal understanding that this technology was going to be here to stay, that um, uh, this was not uh, simply a, a technical curiosity. Uh, but very quickly, uh, people began to see the potential of the airplane. 
1909, with the, the, the great aviation meet at RANS, it really did establish the technology. It really did kind of uh, uh, establish itself as something that was not only going to be a viable from a technical point of view, but was really going to have a significant impact. Uh, there were, as I say, hundreds of thousands of spectators, but perhaps even more importantly, there were the great political leaders of the day, military leaders of the day, uh, business people who were uh, potentially in a position to invest in this technology. The, the great movers and shakers of the era uh, attended this meet and saw this technology and uh, uh, recognized its, its significance. So this gathering um, was, was a spectacular in many, many ways. In terms of the flying part of the event, uh, there were uh, 38 airplanes that uh, were registered uh, to participate in the meet. 23 actually made flights that were there. Uh, and some of these pilots um, uh, had never flown before coming to the meet. They had acquired an airplane and, and were making their first flights as part of this competition. Um, others were already famous. Uh, uh, Louis Blériot, perhaps the most famous, who just one month before, in July of 1909, had made the channel crossing flight. And that was, couldn't have been more uh, could have been a better advertising for the event. Uh, the, the meet itself was announced in the spring of 1909, and uh, when Blériot uh, made his famous flight, and you have to understand, the, the Blériot Channel flight in 1909, prior to the Lindbergh Transatlantic flight in 1927, that was the great flight in aviation. It remained for years after the most famous, the most significant, the, the, the sort of uh, milestone flight. And uh, so this couldn't have been better advertising. Uh, for the, the Aviation Week at RANS that Louis Blériot himself was going to be there and, and fly his airplane. Uh, but numerous other um, uh, uh, increasingly well-known uh, aviators were participating. However, there was a, one conspicuous absence, the Wright brothers. Now, of course, the Wright brothers uh, had conquered France, so to speak, in 1908 and 1909 with the first public demonstrations of their airplane. In August of 1908, Wilbur Wright demonstrated uh, an improved version of the 1903 flyer uh, in France and immediately um, became a world uh, well-known celebrity figure in aviation. He um, was making flights of an hour or more in duration uh, with, great, uh, with great facility and clearly had uh, shown the world that the Wrights were well ahead of everyone else and, and established uh, themselves as the great aviation pioneers. And the Wrights um, continued to uh, uh, make demonstration flights throughout 1908 and into 1909. They did compete for uh, prizes, you know, certain uh, altitude prizes, distance prizes, uh, speed prizes, and so forth. But they were not very high on exhibition flying. They uh, thought that in many ways uh, it was dangerous and that uh, accidents could contribute to hindering the advancement of flight, that the reputation of the technology would be hindered by uh, doing what they called fancy flying or, or aerobatic flying uh, because there were exhibition pilots who were uh, getting killed with some regularity uh, uh, testing the limits of their airplanes. Uh, they also um, uh, didn't feel that these kinds of spectacles uh, were going to really advance aviation. They felt that it would sort of trivialize the technology. They, I think they were dead wrong in that regard. I think that uh, they didn't understand the PR value of something like uh, these, these air shows and, and, and exhibition events. So the Wright brothers were conspicuously absent. Uh, Wilbur was uh, uh, noted as saying that, uh, well, if they want to go and have their race, that's up to them, but you know, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Uh, he was quite, quite down on the whole thing. However, there were Wright airplanes represented. There were about six Wright airplanes uh, uh, at, at the meeting. Um, the Wrights uh, in 1908 had uh, established a relationship with a French syndicate to license built Wright airplanes in France. So there were a, a half a dozen Wright airplanes who had registered to fly there, so their technology was represented. But the lone American uh, representative at RANS was a fellow called Glenn Curtis. And this is a Curtis airplane hanging just above here. And Curtis, uh, was uh, sort of the, uh, the dark horse. Uh, the pilots were dominated by, by French, uh, French pilots. There were some uh, British and uh, there was an Austrian pilot as well. But uh, the only American there was Curtis. And he uh, had uh, built his airplane very similar to the one that you see here uh, just before the competition to prepare for the competition. He had never flown the airplane prior to uh, going to France. 
he shipped it over in, in some uh, uh, crates. And when he arrived, uh, everyone looked at him and said, well, you know, is there an airplane in all those little boxes? See, they didn't think that there was, enough, there was enough crates to actually even make up enough parts for an airplane. So he assembled his machine and, and uh, had a very fine engine that uh, he had designed and built uh, for it and was focusing on the speed event. The great uh, sort of crowning event in the, uh, in the RANS meet was the Gordon Bennett Cup, which was the, the, the speed event, the closed course speed event. And Gordon Bennett was a very uh, prominent uh, publishing magnate in this period. He uh, was the publisher of the New York Herald and the Paris Herald and had been the sponsor of many uh, uh, competitions in this period, uh, yachting, yachting races, motor car races, balloon races, balloon events, uh, and had sponsored a lot of these kinds of events. And he, he sponsored uh, the great speed event, the Gordon Bennett Cup. And this was going to be the concluding event in the, in the week. And by the time the, the week rolled around, uh, Curtis um, was concerned about uh, participating in any of the other events because he didn't want to damage his airplane. Uh, and he was uh, concerned about uh, 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 other problems that he was having with the machine. And uh, so he held back, and he held back. And everybody was wondering, well, when is Curtis going to make the great, the great presentation of his airplane? And uh, late in the week, uh, he made a test flight with the airplane. And uh, it was uh, incredibly fast. It actually had a speed of well over 40 miles an hour. And uh, everyone was uh, surprised, oh my god, how could this, uh, this guy from uh, the United States, who nobody really knew much about, with this uh, seemingly um, uh, unsophisticated airplane, even by the standards of the day, uh, was going to challenge for the great Gordon Bennett Cup. And of course, the great favorite of the, to win the Gordon Bennett Cup was Louis Blériot. Blériot had come with a new airplane, uh, the Blériot 12. The Blériot 11 was the type he flew across the channel. Uh, the Blériot 12 was a, uh, a next version of that. And he had a, a very powerful, but of the day, 60 horsepower engine in it. Everybody thought Blairy was going to run away with, uh, with the Gordon Bennett Cup. Uh, he uh, he uh, logged his flights and uh, 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 posted a speed of, uh, uh, of about 45 miles an hour. Uh, it's a closed course to, uh, speed uh, average. And Curtis, Curtis then uh, made his, his, his attempt. And uh, he beat out the great Blario by flying at an average speed of 46 and a half miles an hour and won the Gordon Bennett uh, trophy, which we have on display in the case uh, just behind you here. It's a very lovely silver, silver trophy. Uh, so uh, uh, Glenn Curtis becomes the great hero of Rands. And uh, the whole event was just a spectacular success from beginning to end and uh, really established, um, uh, again, the, the sort of uh, beginnings of what I consider uh, the beginnings of modern aviation. You might uh, think of it in terms of if, if the Wright brothers and the 1903 airplane represented the birth of flight, uh, 1909 uh, represented the beginning of the adolescence of flight. Obviously, we had a long way to go before uh, aviation was a, a, a truly established technology in, in the ways that it is today. But uh, it was that critical year in 1909 that you really started to see the beginning of this technology um, uh, emerge in a meaningful way. And the RANS meeting in 1909 uh, was kind of that, in some ways, the coming out party uh, of, of aviation. And many of the airplanes that you see here, the Wright Airplane, the Blario Airplane, Curtis Airplane, were the types of airplanes that were uh, being flown and displayed at RANS and uh, really um, formed the, the beginnings of, of the aircraft industry. Uh, the Blario Airplane that you see here, this is actually uh, a very late Blario from 1914. Blario um, himself uh, established one of the largest, the largest manufacturing uh, aircraft manufacturing company in the pre-war period between 1909 and 1913 uh, before the First World War. About 800 Blerios were manufactured. This is a, a very late one. Uh, so uh, Blerio, uh, with his uh, channel flight and his performance at RANS, uh, really uh, was able to launch uh, really a little industry uh, based on, on his success. So this is the technology of the day. This is, uh, this is what really launched uh, aeronautics in, in what I consider uh, is sort of modern practical era. Thank you for listening to this edition of Ask an Expert. A companion question and answer session for this lecture may also be available. For a schedule of upcoming Ask an Expert lectures at the museum, please visit www.nasm.si.edu.